Welcome to the World Changes in Tech by German Tech. My name is Anna Yukiko Bickenbach. And with us all the way from Stockholm, Sweden, we have the wonderful Eva Carlson, CEO of Houdini Sportswear, joining us. And we will be talking about a very exciting topic uh, with the title, The Beauty of Spareheading Industry Transformation. And when I first talked to Eva, we, I got a sense of, of her story and what Houdini is doing. And uh, then she told me about some of these amazing frameworks that they're using um, for themselves to, to innovate within the industry because the fashion industry is not an easy one. Um, and I'm sure Eva will be able to tell us a little bit more about that uh, since the supply chains are really long and uh, there's a lot of innovation uh, going on in that branch. And Eva is a big part of it with Houdini Sportswear. And we're really excited for her to tell us more about that uh, once everyone has arrived. Um, all of our world changes in tech topics are underlined with United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And in this case, we're talking about SCG 8, Decent Work and Economic Growth, 9, Industry Innovation and Infrastructure, and 12, obviously, Responsible Consumption and Production. Um, this World Changes in Tech is an open lecture format, which means that Eva will be giving us her deep insights and learning um to what she has been working on at houdini and with that i will stop sharing my screen so you can see eva hello eva welcome wonderful that you could join us today thanks for having me really nice to be joining you guys so and uh, with that now i think all uh, most of our viewers are in we will start our topic of the beauty of spareheading industry transformation with Eva, CEO from Houdini Sportswear. And with that, Eva, I give you the floor. Thanks, Anna. And uh, please stop me if you have any questions. I will. <laughs> so Houdini Sportswear, a Swedish outdoor brand uh, based here in Stockholm. Uh, I will try to share as much as I uh, can in this hour and uh, hopefully it will be relevant for with people within the industry designers or innovators uh, also across industries um, but of course my passion lies within outdoor and my exams will be outdoor today but I wanted to start with a, a, a film actually uh, so I'll, I'll get back to you soon but here's a little glimpse into our work This is a taste of the future, to be able to cook from things we recycle. I think for Houdini, it's always been about creating something which is pure. Pure enough to, to have a continuous life. When making this fabric, the process was quite long. It was several years, actually, because we didn't want to compromise between the function and the aesthetics. So we mixed merino wool with other biodegradable fibers. I have been uh, composting for since more than 40 years, and, but never textiles. It's important that you do not use material which contains toxic substances because it can destroy the process and it makes the compost material unusable. So to be able to make something biodegradable, we really question the base layers that we do and to make sure that they're pure enough. And by only putting naturals in there, which belongs in nature to start off with, we can also bring it back to nature. The soil from, from the compost, you can use it as a perfect fertilizer, perfect soil improvement, and it makes your growing much more healthy than otherwise. Houdini's clothes feels very down to earth and honest, so the challenge was to capture that in every dish. What we could do was, for example, make a broth from the, from the mushrooms. We could dry mushrooms, we could smoke mushrooms. So we tried to put all of that together into one dish. Väldigt konkret när man ser gamla kläder bli fina måltider på en tallrik. 
coming from uh, a completely different uh, story and coming back here in our place, that is, is really something amazing. In our bigger vision, we, we somehow want to create this positive company that just contributes to the world rather than, than taking it from it. That was wonderful. So basically it's kind of showing, I mean, for one, there was a wow moment in terms of being able to eat what you produce. And I guess that's the, the, the cycle or the circle that they're showing that you can compost some of the materials and food can grow out of it. Yes, uh, and I, I'll not get into that particular project, but um, I will get into a lot about uh, systems approach and having a holistic view of um, product you design and materials you innovate and how we can have a, a much more amazing system working with a flow, a, a natural flow of materials and products and within a system knowledge as well. I think knowledge sharing is like, this is a good example of this uh, this evening, but uh, to, to adapt or actually copy nature as a system, there's uh, there's a lot of beauty in there that we can copy uh, and uh, evolve as a society and have a much, much healthier lifestyle and on a much healthier planet. So, um, yeah, I think the, the way that the corporate world has developed very fast and uh, in, in silos for many years or even decades, uh, we're trying to get out of those silos and have a broader horizon and find much more interesting solutions that way. So I'll get back to that. But I think this is a fun example of how, yeah, we try to do good uh, and we for sure uh, take our mentality as athletes with us uh, because this is tough stuff. It took four and a half years for us to to even get the first product out that was pure enough for this uh, type of composting. And then we need to question ourselves and conventions to push boundaries and, uh, and, and really, really innovate. Uh, innovate in a, in a way that really contributes to, uh, to progression in our, in our world. And then have fun while, while at it. I mean, so, that... I was going to say that's a great insight too that sometimes innovation takes time and you know four years it takes to then be able to present a really clear uh, a video vision video of, of what you're working for yeah and the project has been moving on since then but to celebrate um, an accomplishment accomplishment like that uh, by creating a fine dining menu which is of course not not of course not our core business uh, that's the way for us to celebrate and have some fun while at it. But I, I move on, Anna, and uh, dig into who we are and, and so forth. So we're a Swedish outdoor company, as I said, and we've been working with circularity and transforming our, our business uh, towards a circular economy since 2001. So we've been doing that for quite a while. Uh, and when I say circular, and I mentioned uh, nature as an example of how, it, how excellent it can work, even though it's a very complex system, of course. Uh, but to have a flow of raw materials, a flow of products, a flow of knowledge within this um, living system, uh, that, is our in, that is what we aim for. And that's the only way we can, we see that we can work as a company and take responsibility and it's been a long journey uh, and we're not we're not uh, we're not there uh, but we've come a long way i think today around 80 percent of our products that we offer are circular meaning that they're made from recycled fiber or organic fiber and designed in a way so that they can go back into the system and stay uh, with the raw materials intact for new products or compostable like in the film so that they create nutrients uh, that are healthy for the soil. Uh, and then we're aiming at reaching 100% circular products only in a couple of years, 2022. Uh, and then we aim at having our 
our entire system of products and services and uh, together with the customers and suppliers to create this ecosystem that is circular in its entirety. That means no waste streams everywhere, anywhere, because waste needs to be elim eliminated as a concept even. Uh, nothing taken from the Earth's crust uh, and so forth. So that is what we aim for and that's, we have another 10 years to accomplish that. That's going to be a, a tough one, but possible, I think. So nature as our blueprint, I think that's, that's really important and um, a source for inspiration for any company, for any inventor or designer uh, to look in and uh, mimic nature. This is a fun example of mimicking nature. Uh, I don't know if it's, um, it was intentional even, but on the right side, you see the, the threads underneath the soil or in the soil in a forest. It becomes the internet of the forest and it's uh, mycelium, like the, the mushroom threads, the roots of the mushrooms that become a communications uh, network for trees quite amazing and on the left side is blockchain and oh, you see how how digital tech even can mimic nature and in material technology of course we have a lot to learn from nature and in biotech everywhere it's really amazing uh, and with digital development uh, and how far we've come there uh, there's there's limitless um, possibilities really to to become as perfectly functioning as nature is. That's, I was just saying, I thought the left side almost looked like uh, neurons. Yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised, but they all kind of fit together. Yes, okay. Yeah. And blockchain for us is, uh, is becoming an interesting um, um, way for us to, to map our supply chains and have um, reliable, but also um, up-to-date data on how things are going and we can evaluate ourselves and so forth. So blockchain is, can become important for a sustainability journey of a company, for sure. But uh, going back uh, to what we, our core business and who we are. Outdoor company, which means we make performance products and our customers call our products addictive, which makes us happy. Um, I will go into the design process of our products uh, a little later, but just to give you an idea of who we are, uh, performance products, premium, so uh, something that you invest in rather than shop for. So not at all fashion, um, but rather we look at it as equipment. And thanks to our great products, I think we also have some fantastic um, ambassadors out there, uh, plenty of proud and happy customers cheering us on around the world. And that's actually how we grow. Uh, we're, we have strong organic growth since uh, we started, uh, which means 20 to 30% per year. And we distributed on 20 markets. And we've done that actually uh, thanks to customers and uh, happy end users who, who cheer us on. So no, no traditional marketing or um, um, advertising. Uh, some other data, uh, and this is, uh, this is data from uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation around how we consume products, apparel. So a garment is used in average uh, in the Western world 10 times before it's thrown away or ends up in the end of the back of the closet. But it doesn't have to be this way. Uh, it's just uh, the way we've ended up through decades of fast fashion and uh, careless production, I would say. When we did a customer survey on uh, one of our products that's been used and designed, it was designed maybe 15 years ago and it's been used by many for many years. The average uh, days of use is 1,287. So the gap in between 10 and 1,287. It's, it's mind blowing if you realize that this is possible and it has probably been possible for many years uh, in terms of modern production 
looking back in history, there was wisdom enough to, to repair products and care for products like a tweed suit or whatever. And so these numbers are not revolutionary in the, ter in the sense of being modern, but in today's trade and apparel industry, this is revolutionary. And it's possible for anybody to copy and we urge everyone to do so. If we look at the flow of materials, uh, textile materials, less than 1% in the industry is being recycled. And if you look at the way we recycle our, um, our textile fibers, it's, a, it's within the 0.1%. That's where you don't lose any quality uh, while recycling, but can do the same quality level time and time again. So in an in a industry that could be circular, there's immense amounts of raw materials that goes straight to the trash, uh, through our, uh, past our wardrobes, but only for a few uses and then goes to the trash. If we look at how, how we've designed our products and how we work uh, as a system today at Houdini, 75% uh, of our um, fibers, raw materials are recycled. And then waste, there's an enormous amount of waste in the textile industry. Um, one truck like this every second goes to landfill or is being incinerated. And here we took the decision many years ago to never ever uh, design products that end up in the trash. So um, we take responsibility, meaning that we take back worn outs. If, if products uh, from Houdini uh, are worn out, we can repair them uh, or recycle them. So nothing sh should really go to waste. And why are we doing this? Because it's, I can tell you it's been, a, it's been amazingly fun and I wouldn't have done it any other way. And I can tell you, I'm, I'm certain that my colleagues feel the same, uh, but it's been a, a lot of struggle. And it's uh, with today's um, economy, it's also uh, quite expensive to work the way we do. Um, but it's absolutely worth it. And I, our drive uh, as a company is of course the love for the great outdoors that we it, we're passionate about being out there in the forest or in the mountains or on the ocean uh, and we're really committed and don't compromise with our well plan to go regenerative to reduce and eliminate our negative impact and then add positive impact to the world. And if we cannot do that, if we, if we would realize that it's just not possible, I don't think uh, many of us would be here anymore. So it's really about uh, a commitment and an uncompromising approach to timelines and uh, how to do the work, which is truly rewarding. And, and one last, the thing that I want to mention and that uh, can be applied if you think about it to any industry. There is an intrinsic value in nature. I mean, these magical, magical places uh, are, of course, wonderful to go to. But it's also a fact that we depend on nature. We're part of nature. Everything that we rely on for resources, fresh water, clean air, and so forth, it's thanks to nature that they exist. And some in the daily life, we don't really reflect around that. But um, there's no business on a dead planet, I think somebody said, and, and it's very true. So there is an intrinsic value um, as well. So we depend on it, on, it, on it, but looking at these places and the species around us, uh, we really don't have um, the right to consume and uh, deplete environment as we have been doing for many for centuries now so that was that's what drives us here at Houdini uh, and and I don't think anybody would could say it any better than this and this is a quote from Bill McDonough who who wrote the book Cradle to Cradle I really think that you should all read Cradle to Cradle if you haven't already this simple question summarizes what we all need to to consider and uh, 
as innovators and uh, business leaders uh, take to our hearts and just decide upon uh, um, getting this right. How do we love all children of all species for all of time? It's a beautiful one and it summarizes uh, everything very simply without uh, leaving anything out, I believe. So the systems approach I was talking about, moving out of the silo uh, and getting the full horizon, uh, that is really, um, it's tough, uh, but it's, it's really rewarding. And I will share some frameworks that we've been using, and, but this one, the planetary framework and how the earth system functions is of course uh, uh, the most essential one. Since several years, uh, many companies are looking at the carbon footprint and uh, we, ha we are as well and our industry is as well. But that, is all, that can also become a silo. And if we're not careful, we end up greenwashing ourselves internally if we only, for instance, measure carbon. Because if we move from one fiber or natural resource, um, which has a high carbon footprint, just move to something else, we might, we might affect uh, biodiversity or uh, land systems or ocean systems in a way that we don't measure and therefore don't know the effects on. So in 2015, we decided that in our innovation process, in our building and developing our company, we needed to learn how the earth system functions. And it's quite simple. You can look at these uh, pies on the, on the chart and it's really, it's climate change, biodiversity, it's fresh water, biochemical flows, and so forth. And if you have an understanding of this system and make sure that you zoom out and uh, not only measure carbon and understand your carbon footprint in the short term, but zoom out and look at the big picture, it's, it's the only way to, to really know that you're doing uh, the right thing and to, do, to reduce your impact on the planet as a whole, because that's what counts really. Uh, so the systems perspective has, has been important, essentially even for our sustainability work. But I would also say that it's been, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's tightening the frameworks for, for what, we can, um, what we can do. But that in itself has um, been rewarding for an innovator and an innovation process or a designer to have this tight framework because Within that become, it, it, there's more challenges, different challenges. Um, you're forced to look from new perspectives and uh, find new solutions. So I would say that uh, our innovation process has become much stronger with this um, holistic or system, systems perspective. And Eva, just a question to the system. Mm -hmm. I would, uh, the, from looking at the system, you would be within the, the smallest circle where, where it says that is where the boundaries are in terms of uh, producing or being involved in a certain ecosystem chain. It's the, the low boundary, which is the safe one, which is like the smallest one. Yes. Uh, if we look at becoming a regenerative company where you don't have any negative impact, that would be, of course, ideal. That mean that means you wouldn't have you would be in the in the spot in the center, and not have an impact. But of course, uh, that's far from where we are today. Uh, and since this illustration was made, uh, the scientists behind this um, this framework, they say that maybe half of the boundaries uh, were out of bounds or moving towards out of bounds in a high speed. For instance, biodiversity is one that has been addressed in the last couple of years, more so. Um, so it's about eliminating as much or reducing as much as possible, moving towards the center. Another question that I re uh, have uh, had uh, a few times, Anna, is so how, how do we calculate what's our fair share uh, of impact? And uh, with an approach of, or with an ambition to become regenerative, uh, it's not about 
uh, understanding our share, how much we can take, but rather how much can we, how much great business and value can we, can we uh, provide without taking any or as little as possible? Yeah. Should I move on? Yes, please. Your last statement was great. <laughs> and and uh, with our approach to uh, becoming circular, uh, our ambition, long-term ambition to become regenerative, that has made us look at the world in a different way. Uh, and it's all, it's fun, I would say, to do this nowadays because there's so many design flaws. Small ones that can be easily fixed and others that are huge and tough for us as a company uh, to solve by ourselves. We have to do it together with a lot of others. But uh, these design flaws, I will share some that I feel um, are important uh, in terms of mindsets. Uh, this photo is actually a, a true photo from a, it's a state in the US um, many years ago and they decided to have a, a cheap way of communicating to their students that they shouldn't do drugs. Uh, and a, a very small design flaw had a, of course, a devastating effect on the message they were trying to portray or give to their students. Anyways, I will share some um, of our findings. So, uh, what, that we have designed everything in a linear system, in a world that is not at all linear, uh, it, it's complex and circular and, and a living um, system. That is a design flaw and a mindset that we can change and have to change. Eliminating the concept of waste. How, a, a company like ours or anybody else who designs a great product and has this uh, um, vision of a fantastic product that's going to revolutionize the world. Uh, and doing that in a linear way where everything one day becomes waste uh, and you have to extract new resources from our one and only planet. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's just a, such a huge and uh, unnecessary mistake. So let's go circular. Another one is just looking at technologies and uh, um, seeing that it's more or less a given today that our technologies um, come at the expense of nature. But what if we just had the mindset of developing technologies that work in partnership with nature? That is also possible. It's just a matter of uh, uh, raising our ambitions or having the right mindset. Collaboration rather than competition. I think uh, as a species, we've come this far because we've been fantastic at collaborating and suddenly competition has taken over uh, so much more than it should and if we can move back to a collaborative mode uh, as a base uh, i think that would be great and we've been collaborating since forever across industries within the industry with some with something that would be traditionally called a competitor um, that is really important and uh, opens up so many more possibilities, especially maybe across industries or in between startups and bigger corporations. I was going to ask, do you also um, um, cooperate or collaborate interdisciplinary? So just maybe like a complete different sector or is it mostly just to get inspired by something new or is it mostly in the fashion? Absolutely not. No, I think that's been the maybe the most rewarding because we we have uh, one once again we can open up new perspectives by working with other industries. So, um, EVs, uh, a Swedish company, um, Polestar, which is doing electric cars, even though cars is, has nothing to do with what we're doing as an outdoor company, um, academia. Uh, innovation hubs across the world, um, furniture companies. So it's it's really, I think it's uh, rewarding uh, to collaborate and uh, to do it broad. <clears throat> One other mindset uh, that I believe is really important that we that we get 
shake loose from or, or, or drop entirely is uh, how we have a corporate culture and a corporate mindset. Um, and that's maybe particularly on the sustainability side. If we have a mindset that um, it's us as individuals, I'm a mother, I'm a sister, I have tons of friends, that is my mindset also when I'm working. Um, because we have to make it, it is personal. We're all interconnected, we're part of this living system in this fantastic planet. And what we do at work and when we innovate and design products and services, uh, it will affect everything. Um, next uh, generations, but also our kids and our environment. So to make this person personal and uh, if anybody tells you differently um, be a, be an activist uh, <laughs> because to accept today here, here today to, to accept some kind of corporate uh, uh, compromising just because um, we have been used to compromising within corporate culture for so many years when it comes to sustainability uh, that that is um, so out of date And this photo, maybe I should tell you, this is uh, my daughter. She drew a picture and I think this is very common um, in every family, maybe in the Western world. When, when they're asked in school to draw a photo of their family, they draw um, yeah, me and her dad and her brother. He's a bit lazy, so he's laying down on the couch. Ah, that's what it is, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, that's, and grandma is here too. But that's family for a Western kid. Mm -hmm. If this would have been an indigenous kid bringing, being brought up in that culture, there would have been this family, but also the, the mountains and the trees and the eagles, and that's family. Mm -hmm. And uh, that type of understanding of our place in the world, uh, we need to get back to that. And uh, that would also open up from an innovation standpoint, uh, new ways of looking at and uh, approaching uh, challenges and opportunities, I believe. It has for us at least. So a, a little about how we go uh, about products uh, and back to zooming in and zooming out and getting um, uh, a, f a feeling or understanding of the, of the system in its entirety. Uh, but also not losing sight of the small details because, because we all know that product innovation and product design, it's all about the details and at the end of the day, uh, you, you cannot miss out on the, on the molecules or the final finishes or whatever. But to create products beyond expectations, uh, to not settle for anything less, I think that is uh, becoming crucial. Uh, but it's also a huge opportunity. I think that is uh, how Houdini grew from a small startup uh, when, I, when I got here to where we are today uh, with 20 markets and, um, and a nice growth journey. We've been, in a, when it, we've been in an industry where many brands forgot to be passionate about the product they were designing. To truly not 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 go um, not accept short uh, lead times or short deadlines just because you have to get the product out at a certain date or whatever or a certain season, but rather um, do it properly and create that product that you actually envisioned once. And when you when you get there, uh, the reward comes naturally. You don't have to do marketing or advertising, and uh, you get all the love you could ever ask for and more from your end users. So once again, if you're a designer and you go out there and they ask you to do a compromise with product, be an activist. Design principles, um, I think it's really, and that's for us uh, in a way zooming out and uh, we all love creating new stuff here, but to zoom out and understand um, what, what we are here for as a company. There might be other companies who are 
doing other things and we don't we shouldn't and uh, and won't do everything here we know our place and our niche so for us the design principles are really essential doing things that are built to last uh, both in terms of quality and style so fashion or trend is is not who we are less is more to do products that are versatile enough so you can have a small wardrobe that works for a lot of stuff uh, and so forth. To, th those uh, design principles have been essential and of course circular is one of them. And when, uh, when we work with suppliers we work with very few and make sure that we select or develop even fabrics together with those few partners. They understand our ambitions and goals and our standards and we can move much faster and further together uh, with, the, with those, those few. Quick question to that. Was it difficult to find those few? No, uh, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't difficult. Uh, we've just simply found those that are best in their, in their particular field across the world. So we have a global supply chain, which is a, which is a challenge for our um, regenerative circular system uh, that we aim to achieve in, in 10 years. Uh, but uh, to find those that are really, really uh, passionate and knowledgeable and ex um, ex have excellence in their particular field, I think that's been the way we, we've done it. And those are few. Uh, and uh, what has been difficult for us, or what used to be difficult, was that we were a small startup having these huge ambitions, which do cost uh, money in terms of innovation, uh, uh, man hours and uh, investments in monetary investments. And um, of course, we hadn't proven ourselves by the, at that time, but nowadays uh, it's much easier. First of all, the environment for sustainable innovation has of course opened up immensely, only the, the last five years or so. But, uh, as a company, we've proven ourselves throughout the year. So I think all, every innovation, it hasn't been wide and broad, but we're really, really precise. We know exactly what we want. And um, together with our partners, we've collaboratively come, come to the point where we can reach our goals together. And we also found um, ways to do business uh, in a good way together. For instance, we would never ask for exclusivity on a technology. We'd rather share it. And that is, of course, much easier also for a supplier to, to find leverage on that new technology that they uh, innovated together with us. Uh, so that's zooming into the small details, trimmings or um, treatments, or we need to know everything. And we do know everything about our products and what goes into them. And if we zoom out again, it's value chains. Um, how, how do we work? How do we ship products? How do the actual sheep on the farm um, uh, live and roam? Are they happy and uh, well taken care of? Uh, do they have a, a life worth living, so to speak? And uh, all the way to here, we manufacture, for instance, everything in Europe still. Uh, and that is because we're a fairly small company, but not only that, it's also because we have these long-term partners, we work to, together with them uh, close and often visit. There's legislation, we know that people get uh, maternity or parental leave and vacation time and so forth, and have a, um, a wage that we can um, that we can be proud of. Here's one that I I um, we didn't know how much we would use it when we made it once um, many years ago. But our designers checklist has proven very efficient for us. We don't like big, uh, you know, big books of guidelines, but rather do simple stuff that really works in the daily environment. And this checklist is something we use at the start of a design process, um, sometimes um, here and there during the design process to make sure that we are not losing sight of who we are or what we want to achieve. 
and then at the end of the day before we before we, before we go too far and find lies uh, it's about everything from uh, questioning if this product is even worth uh, developing to will it age with beauty i love that one uh, or does it have a next life solution but a uh, simple checklist like this uh, and having that as a discussion point in a design or innovation process i think it's been amazingly uh, effective in its simple uh, it's in, it's in its simplicity my initial reaction to this was uh, we should make one of these for uh, whether or not a B2B checklist, if you want to work with that and with a company, whether they're sustainable or not. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. it just asked, like eight questions that say, should you work with them or not? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> I, I, we actually do have, th this is the one that we use the most, but we have a few others. And no, no heavy booklets here with guidelines. It's, it's more uh, things like this that you can put on the wall. And this way of zooming in and zooming out in the design or innovation process that goes for product design, but it also goes for how we do, how we work with material innovation together with partners. And it works, works uh, equally well when um, doing digital design, like uh, service design for us, or this uh, blockchain, uh, transparency and traceability uh, system, for instance, and when we do business model innovation. In all these cases, we, have to have, we do have the systemic approach, and in order to get that uh, full perspective or uh, helicopter view, and then zoom into the details so that we don't um, uh, miss out on something, but that exercise is going on all the time here within the uh, within the office and, and um, studios. If I, if I may, the last question, uh, the, the last slide that you had, um, have you been able to also influence some of the suppliers you worked with in order to create new technological innovations to help uh, produce the things you need for your standard? Um, yes, that's what we've been doing all the time, I would say. Uh, and I, Maybe I wasn't clear, but it was it was uh, much much harder many years ago when we were very small and hadn't proven ourselves. Uh, maybe also those the goals that we had then, uh, which are the same now, of course, but those goals were awkward to many at that time. Why why would we why would we want to use recycled material for a, for a fabric that is expensive, for instance, when there's virgin? Why would we use recycled? That was a question we, we received. Uh, and moving circular since then has of course become an ambition for so many, uh, and that is uh, amazing to see. But what we, had, what we have been doing throughout the years, whether it's been um, a collaborative effort where we had the same ambitions to start with, or when it was the case that we just, uh, never gave up, started uh, or kept on uh, bugging them with our requests. Uh, we set common goals and have a very, it's, it's a relationship that has to be built on trust um, and openness um, so that there's um, a win-win situation and understanding of that. But uh, a close dialogue. I think it's uh, more like a, it's a very a genuine relation that we have with everyone. But we also set common goals and uh, and plan ahead. Um, so it's a, it's a mix of the soft and the and the hard, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, but we do set goals together, uh, and with the goals that we have now uh, ahead of us like uh, eliminating all the microplastics or waste streams that are microplastics might be a very small one for us, but that one has to go as well. Uh, that will require lots of work from us and from our suppliers. Another one is uh, moving to renewable energy. That is something that we have come far here in Europe with uh, and in some other places in the world. Uh, but in other regions, for instance, Japan, it's a long way to go. 
I think we can move fast uh, there. Not only us, society as a, as a whole we, will probably be able to move fast because the technology, the pricing uh, is so different nowadays. Renewables will, um, will take over step by step and faster than probably we, we all think. But it's going to take, require a lot of work um, for sure. So to plan, to plan together and not only have um, metrics uh, to compare, but also it, it has to be also emotionally relevant, I think, for both, both parties. So that there's um, a common um, drive, you know, a passion to get there. I think that's been uh, what we've tried to cross pollinate from our side towards others. And uh, nowadays, we have the luxury of working with so many partners that are already um, up to speed and, uh, of course, advanced, um, way more advanced than us in particular field. Uh, but there's a, there's a conscious movement among uh, companies and innovators and uh, innovation hubs uh, that is amazing to see. The, the last maybe couple of years, I would say, uh, I can feel that there's a, a great wave of uh, like-minded, and that makes me hopeful, really, that we will be able to um, reach, well, reach our goals um, and uh, have a lot of other colleagues in the business and elsewhere uh, move along, moving along with us uh, in that direction. Otherwise, uh, there's not much hope for our planet, is there? <laughs> well, we do. Well, thankfully, due to your presentation, we could tell the CEOs of the future what they need to do in order to head the, the companies and the industries in the right way. <laughs> I think you're getting to that in the next slides too, right? Yeah, so business model innovation, I'll, uh, we do rental and uh, repairs and um, we've uh, We've been researching and uh, exploring um, subscription services and all kinds of exciting stuff that we believe is um, um, relevant and uh, important for the future of uh, the circular sharing economy. Uh, but to frameworks, um, I think uh, scientific or science-based frameworks is really important and those frameworks it, don't, it doesn't mean that you know everything about the science in every in depth, but you have to understand the logic. Um, and in our case, we started working with the Earth system scientists, and uh, we will continue doing so. And as we've come quite far as a company, uh, the questions or the challenges we have are are more complex nowadays than they used to be. Moving from virgin to recycled fiber, for instance, that's, that's common sense. But, but understanding if we should go for bio-based fibers or stay with recycled polymers, uh, that is a question that we need to hold hands with somebody who, who's a scientist for. So um, this is the planetary boundaries framework. It was developed by scientists across the world, but one of the um, scientist hubs is here in Stockholm, the, the Stockholm Resilience Centre. And here's the one. Uh, here's the graphic where you can see more. Uh, the green part is where you where we need to be in order to have a, a safe operating space and a balanced planet where where we don't see. Um, climate catastrophes and uh, droughts and floods and everything that we're witnessing now and we will witness more of uh, looking ahead. But as I said, we're out of bounds in more, more than this. This is a slide that is, um, or the graphics has been updated since. So we have lots of work to do to get back into the green space. Another one is the social system, and this is actually a combination of the planetary boundaries and the social system. Uh, if you haven't heard of Donut Economics, that's also a book that you should read. read. Um, Kate Rayworth has written, she worked at Oxfam at the time, but this is a, the foundation, uh, the social or societal foundation uh, that we use as a framework. And then I know that uh, you're into SDGs, 
and we like them too. Uh, and I just wanted to share a way of looking at the SDGs, which is um, split in the biosphere, society and economy. Oh, I love that. So it's the same goals, it's just uh, made into a wedding cake. And this is what um, this is how we see it because, uh, of course, the foundation needs to be the biosphere. It doesn't help if we uh, work only on a couple of um, goals in the midsection society and economy. Economy, uh, if we fail on the biosphere, we've failed the system. Uh, and uh, I would also stress that even though we realize that we focus and have the biggest impact on very few goals we have to have the perspective of all of them and understand our impact on all of them this is a so that we don't shift impact from one to the other yes yeah, sorry i didn't mean to disturb you i was going to say this is a houdini creation right no it's not it's actually also from uh, uh, the stockholm resilience center Oh, okay. Or, okay. or I shouldn't, maybe. I, I received it from them anyways. Oh, okay, okay. I was going to say it's great because it kind of puts the, the SDGs in, in a certain framework where you can understand the relation to each other. Yeah. Um, I was going to say they should send it to the UN. but <laughs> they, I, I'm sure they have it. I, I, I know they have it. But I also uh, like the, the symbol that they, the very, very minimalistic symbol uh, of the, the goals that is just a, a graphic circle with the colors and the goals as as it is a system really um, and the one that you can have as a, a pin as well but anyways um, only taking a couple of goals and siloing in on those uh, it's not a good idea please take consider the wedding cake <laughs> <clears throat> but these scientific frameworks they wouldn't have helped us much if we had only them. I think also uh, to combine those scientific frameworks, but with the foundation of our understanding of purpose, where, what's our place as a company? Um, who do we wanna be? Uh, what, what will our legacy or what should our legacy be? Which are our values and what is our vision? And, it's more of a spiritual or philosophical uh, common um, way of looking at it, the soft part that I need, that I think is absolutely necessary to combine with a more technocratic part, so to speak, uh, so that we have our, our hearts and our brains involved in each project and everything we do. And um, I guess we've, we try to share as much as possible and I think this thanks for this opportunity there's no there's no reason for us to to do what we're doing and even succeed as a company if we don't get to inspire many others to do the same and share our way of working to, to, with anybody who wants to learn um, because that is the only way we can build a society and the world that we think is possible together and uh, much more brilliantly and uh, beautiful than uh, wh where we're heading today. But anyways, uh, as an addition to opportunities like this, we also uh, have a few reports, a couple of reports that I wanted to suggest that are on our website. You find them there and we've written them in a way that I hope makes it uh, worthwhile to read, but also maybe worthwhile to to take, to take inspiration from or even have um, um, a look at the methodology um, around certain areas or principles that we use and apply them um, to wherever you're at, uh, at school or in a company somewhere else, in, a, in another industry maybe. So this is Houdini, this is the, the the report we started working on in 2015 with the Stockholm Resilience Center and their consultancy Albaeco. And um, we, we were the first, I think, company in the world to uh, try to assess. Of course, this was a pilot, so it's not easy, but trying to assess our impact on the planet as a whole. So not only carbon, but rather the, the entirety. Extremely uh, interesting 
what a learning experience. I can only uh, suggest that um, that you find your own scientists to hold hands with or, or some some um, um, consultancy that can help you because it is a learning experience if you uh, want to understand your impact and really understand how you can also improve it. Uh, this is the only way and it's so rewarding as I said and also from an innovation standpoint it makes us look at our company and our products and our services and our, and our customers in new ways with, and with new perspectives. You have um, a capacity to innovate in a much more um, out of the box way. So please take a look at it and uh, go hold hand with earth system scientists. They're great and important. <laughs> and then another, um, another report that we finalized quite, and it's also a pilot. Uh, nothing is ever f finalized at Udini. We, we, have, we, only, we only find uh, new challenges that we need to address and uh, explore. And this one is about not our production because we've we've focused a lot on production uh, our products to be circular in design and uh, responsible in the way we produce them in terms of raw materials and social aspects ethical aspects and so forth but what about consumption what about uh, the way we the, the lifestyle that we have developed and brands have developed and marketing guys have been developing for decades um how how can we address that being a responsible company we for sure have to address it because there's a huge potential for us to to inspire and enable lifestyles that are different from the the, the lifestyles that we lead today where we consume for instance here in sweden i think we everyone consumes in average more than four planets per year. It's high here in, in the Nordics because of uh, heating and the cold winters, but the global average is more than two planets per year. So that means we, we use more than the double uh, of the resources that, are, that our planet can take. So there's a deficit and uh, if we're not acting, we're leaving it for our kids to pay. Um, so understanding how we as a company, a brand that uh, might have both a strong, a strong impact on, on trends and lifestyle choices and the way you shop and consume and behave. Um, let's tap into that and understand how we together with others can shift lifestyles to something that is more sustainable and maybe worthwhile and maybe more beautiful. Uh, in the sense of having a, a fulfilling life. I don't think anybody, if they really reflect, uh, have a fulfilling life by going to a shopping mall, shopping every weekend. Um, I think there's much more to, uh, as an individual, to, to evolve and experience in, in life. Um, and maybe the GDP way of measuring um, value uh, is outdated of course but uh, it, it's um, we're in the age of the machine and the gdp way of measuring things so it's it's um, important for us all to reflect on that and and try to figure out if we can um, if we can think and act differently and uh, nudge ourselves and society to to in a new direction so lifestyle is uh, extremely important in that sense. When we, when we estimate, we see that what we can achieve as a, brand, a lifestyle brand in terms of changing uh, behavior, maybe that's even, maybe, maybe have a, a bigger effect uh, on sustainability than our changes in production. Not that we would uh, stop working on um, circular production and so forth, we wouldn't. But to understand that there's a possibility here to to move even further that's uh, one part of the the life the regenerative lifestyle initiative was measuring how many 
days of use our products have. And of course, if, if you buy a product that you use 10 times, and then you have the possibility to buy a product that you actually not only can use one more than a thousand times, but actually do use more than a thousand times, that means a lot for uh, reducing production volumes and uh, uh, spending, hopefully, time reading a book or uh, going out to nature or hanging out with friends uh, rather than spend money shopping for new stuff. And I agree, we have to simplify a, a lot more things in our lives. Um, I don't know, wh what is the time, Anna? How much time do we have? And the time is, I wish I could give you all the time in the world, um, but unfortunately we, we have to uh, come to an end at some point. But I, I wanted yeah. to also for you know, giving us this great presentation as to how Houdini itself within the company, um, the values that you're bringing to the table, the way you're looking at uh, producing and spearheading and, and helping the industry um, innovate from, from in, in itself. Uh, and I want to be able to, I want to address a few questions that we, we have uh, that are quite interesting so we can use the last few minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of a lot of the things are that you have are also outdoor it's outdoor sportswear and we had a question in terms of maybe innovation and waterproofing the jackets is there uh, the question is how circular is the jacket is what kind of technology do you use to repel is the repellent in itself not so, I, unsustainable I don't know what the right mm -hmm. word um, there's more work to do there for sure uh, but we have, since several years now, we, we, we have uh, moved from, uh, from a certain type of DWR, a durable water repellent that has uh, fluorocarbons in it. Uh, we moved away from that, I don't know if it's more than five years ago, a long time ago anyways, considering that there are many brands in our um, premium segment of the market that are still using those um, for more or less all their shell layers. Uh, the, the challenge is to have high, the high performance um, and a durable water repellent, but considering these are chemicals that shouldn't even have been um, used at all um, in, in consumer products. And the same goes for for the membranes that are used in many waterproof shells. Uh, the membranes are, are made by chemicals that shouldn't be in any consumer products um, for many reasons. Uh, but one reason is that they cannot be recycled, but uh, that there's uh, environmental issues and health issues as well. So um, when we started designing shell layers, that was a given for us from the start. So it, take, it took a few years for us to, to reach um, a seller that we could bring to market. But at, the, at that time and still, they are pure polyester. So there's a, a great membrane made out of polyester that is um, uh, breathable and waterproof. And then you have a face fabric and a scrim fabric on the inside, that, that, which is also polyester. Uh, so that means the whole package is polyester uh, and it is recyclable at the level of a pet bottle. So a shell layer from, shell layer from Houdini can be used, I don't know, 10 years or whatever. And then if it wears out, uh, it, we can take it back and make a new shell layer out of it. That is technology that has been existing for, I don't know, 15 years and very few in the industry use it uh, and and i don't know more than a couple or three maybe that have decided to only use these sustainable technologies of course that's how we work uh, we wouldn't use anything else thank you for for clarifying that we also had a uh, a fun question from bjorn um who says is it pure coincidence that the leading sustainable outdoor brands in sweden and germany which is yourself mm -hmm. and Ibits van Baudi are led by women. Yeah, and that must be a, a coincidence. I believe so. 
I won't go deeper <laughs> into well, that. Maybe, or if, if anything, may, uh, may I talked about corporate culture and uh, personal values. Uh, I wouldn't want anybody to come in here and and be forced to live um, or work in a way that uh, is contradictory to their personal values. And as a mother, I, as I said, it, it's, um, it's for me natural uh, to question a corporate culture that is um, contradictive to, a personal, um, to our personal values. Maybe that's easier for somebody who's not been um, going to business school. Maybe it's easier for a, a woman who has kids. I don't know. It, c it should be just as easy for dads who have kids, but that's, we're, we're getting there uh, fast. It's, it's a different world. So I wouldn't say gender. I, there are other things uh, as well. Um, and then, uh, just to think about the, the company values, when you, obviously when you hire someone, you make sure that they align with your company's values, right? Because you said everyone's, every story should be, it should be personal. So I feel like a lot of the outputs that come from a company are very much reflected off of the team. So if there was someone, let's, let's just say there's a CEO, yeah. okay. I want to go with the planetary boundaries and um, what are like the three steps you would recommend them to do now? Find somebody to collaborate with. And uh, I think all great leaders understand that they're probably not, not very good at, uh, there's always people who are better, better equipped, more knowledgeable, more experienced, or uh, better equipped uh, to, to take on a certain field. Uh, so being humble and making sure that you have this dream team at your side, uh, including, including those maybe on the outside. But um, that is, I think, uh, important. What, that, what is that? Collaborate, um, having uh, per, individuals at your side that uh, can achieve great things. I think maybe then uh, it has to be fun. Mm -hmm. You have to love it. Okay. To work, with, maybe, to work in a field that you really truly believe in um, and are passionate about. Uh, about. Uh, to me, to work with earth system sciences and being curious and, uh, and wanting to learn, uh, then it becomes rewarding. If, if I wouldn't be like that, I, I don't think it, uh, it would feel like a heavy, heavy effort, um, a mountain to climb. Um, this has been a fun mountain, so you better, you better find fun mountains to climb, whether you're working at uh, yeah, any company. I love that metaphor. A good challenge can be fun, especially yep. if it's- It has to be. <laughs> And with that, I want to say again, uh, you obviously give us a book tip to read Cradle to Cradle, which I have somewhere in my bookshelf. And then it was the uh, donut, uh, donut Economics, right? Or was it Donut? Yeah. Donut Economics by Kate Rayworth. Yes, Donut Economics. And um, with that, if I want, I want to thank you for this wonderful open lecture and the insights you were able to give us to all of our participants today. And I uh, just want to make sure that if you guys want to stay connected to German Tech, you can sign up to our newsletter. Um, so Eva, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, I hope we get to talk again very soon. And until then, um, much luck to you and further on with Houdini and changing the fashion industry. We need more companies like you. So thank you again for being part of our evening. Thanks, Anna, for a great conversation. And thanks, everyone, for good questions. So with that, everyone, take care, have a great evening, and stay safe. Cheers. Take care. Bye-bye.